Good morning. morning. Scripture reading today is in Luke 18, 35 through 42. As Jesus drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting beside the road begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, they told him. So he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Who, <clears throat> those who led the way abolished, abolished him to be silent, but he cried out all the louder, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and directed that man to be brought to him. When he had been brought near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, he said, let me see again. Receive your sight, Jesus replied. Your faith has, <coughs> your faith has healed you. So be it. So as you give hugs today, Kim being one, I got this, I got this today that says, worry weighs a person down, an encouraging word cheers a person up. So as you give hugs to her today, and it goes on, he went on to say, as you lead in different ways today, look for the person who may be weighed down, give them a smile, a hug, or a kind word. Let's be God's physical touch to someone who needs it today. So as you hug Kim, say it again. And as you hug uh, Kira, remember Kira, you can see her eye, where her eye is, that's her side. So hug her from the other side. But she could use your encouraging hugs and so could a big girl back there use your encouraging hugs. We are the body of Christ. The problem with the walk and the problem with so many things is this great salvation that we proclaim that we have must not mean it's so great to us. Because we make every excuse, and I hope you're reading Luke so that you see all that. Luke is writing this so that you know what you believe. He uses more parables than anyone else. And he writes in a perspective that you've got to decide if this is what I really believe or not. Because that's what a Christian professes. A Christian professes they're going to be like Christ in this world. But will they? Or will other things stand in the way? Will they make excuses and everything else? And you know what? Eternity weighs in the balance. So let's start with prayer, and then we're going to dig into Luke. And Diana, keep me on track, because today is uh, potluck and board meeting. I don't want to go too long, but i got five long chapters to cover, okay? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you, for you are worthy of all of our glory, our praise, and our honor. Father, forgive us when we take such a salvation so lightly, when we make excuses, Lord. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, that you would come to dwell with us, to tabernacle with us, is beyond anything I can even express in the first place, because we are sinful, wretched creatures, totally bankrupt spiritually. But instead of abandoning us, you gave your son to die for us, to take our place, to take... The, uh, the punishment upon his shoulders, your wrath, so that we could be atoned, so that we could be bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Help us not to take that lightly. Help us to realize we are the body of Christ, to reach out and to love others as we love you, as Christ loved and gave himself for us. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. Fill us with your spirit today to be more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was blind. What's the rest of it? What's your story? But now I see. Do you? Do you see clearly? Do you see that you're called to give up your life to follow after Jesus? That your life was never your own in the first place? That every breath you take is God's grace upon you and it's His mercy upon you on top of that because Christ died when we were still sinners. There is none righteous, no, not one. Don't think too highly of yourself, but instead examine yourself. We see sight restored to a blind man, and that's where we're going to make it to today. We're going to cover where I left off in Luke chapter 8. Is that right? No. 13. 
I'll get it right. And we're going to make it through 18. Okay. As we closed in chapter, or we left off in chapter 13, you had this message to you. Repent or perish. Because it's not about the good things you've done. It's not about the bad things that, that they've done. It's if you don't repent, you're going to perish as well. I was blind. What? Now I see. Do you truly see? Do you understand what Jesus Christ has called you to be? That He has called you to be His disciple, to trust in Him, to forsake everything else, and follow in His footsteps, bringing light to the world as Jesus Christ fills you with light. In Luke 13, verse 6, He told them this parable. A parable is a further teaching illustration, and there are more of them in the Gospel of Luke than any other one. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up good soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit the next year, then fine. If not, cut it down. That's where we left off. Are you bearing fruit? If the sower came to sow seed, he sowed seed in your heart, which is the Word of God, to change you, to transform you, to be like Christ in this world. Not to live for your own will, but for His will. Not to live for your kingdom or the kingdoms of this world, but to live for His kingdom. And the kingdom of God is among you. It is here in front of you now. It is for something for you to be a good steward of, to live as Christ lived in this world. Hypocrisy is acting like you're this particular person. You're playing out this role. You're on the stage and you're playing out whether you're a Christian or not. Are you playing a role or are you a Christian? Does God and this salvation that you have mean so much that you can't keep silent, that you can't live for Jesus Christ? Does it permeate you that God would love you so much that He would give His Son to die for you? And if that is how you feel, then you're compelled to love God and to love others. It's a part of your spiritual nature. And as you let the Spirit guide you, as you let the Spirit fill you, as you die to yourself to live for Christ, the more you will be transformed into the image of Christ. But so many people think they are righteous. They think they are saved. They think they are better than someone else. And we continue to see this in the Gospel of Luke. And there were these religious hypocrites. We see this all the time. And there is a person that's been paralyzed for 18 years. And they say, well, don't heal on the Sabbath. Verse 15, the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give, to give water? You do work. As simple as untying your donkey, but you do that because you have compassion on this animal. How can you not have compassion on other people? How can you not tell them this knowledge that you have that used to be secret, but now you know the, kingdoms, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven? And these parables help teach us further along. Verse 16, Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years long, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bounded her? He ended, we ended last week with a parable, and we're going to start this week with a parable. Then Jesus asked them, verse 18, What is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? You've seen the kingdom of God in Luke several times up to this point, but now Jesus is explicitly describing what the kingdom of God looks like, which is among you, and you're supposed to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Change your way of thinking so that it changes your actions so that you live as though you belong to the kingdom of God, not hypocritically as you're acting out a role. <clears throat> it is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew up and became a tree, and the birds perched on its branches. Again he asked, What shall I compare the kingdom of God to? Verse 20, It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 60 pounds of flour until it worked all throughout the dough. He is training up his disciples as, as he's dealing with the religious hypocrisy of the day. Jesus is trying to get them all to repent so that they do not perish. Thirty-two times you'll see the kingdom of God referred to. And you'll see it more than that 
not referred to when it says again, and this and that. 32 times. Do you think that's significant? The kingdom of God is at hand. Are you going to continue to live your life the way you did? Are you going to live as a hypocrite? Or are you going to live as a child of the kingdom of God? And you can't do it. You've got to let Jesus do it through you. It's the reason that the Holy Spirit comes and sanctifies you and seals you so that you can continue to be sanctified and be more and more and more and more like Christ. It does matter how you live. That's why James had to write, unless your faith has actions, he says your faith is dead. That means that you're still dead in your trespasses and sin. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth on the day that Jesus returns because many think, and they even did mighty deeds, they think they will spend an eternity with God. But Jesus says, depart from me, I do not know you. And I'll remind you again that Luke is writing from a physician's point of view, one that has given up the world. He is writing an orderly account so that you will know what you believe and practice it for the healing of your very soul instead of the healing of your body. He continues to tell us about being servants and good stewards, and he gives more and more parables. Verse 22, Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. He knows what is set before him, and he joyfully goes to Jerusalem to face God's wrath so that you don't have to. In verse 23, someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Boy, this should hit you in the Gospel of Luke. He said to them, verse 24, Make every effort to enter through the narrow gate, because many, I tell you, and this is in the other Gospels as well, few versus many. We can look back at the Old Testament. See, there was a remnant versus all these people to claim to be of Abraham and to be of Israel. Many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Verse 25, once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading. Sir, open the door for us, but he will answer. I do not know you or where you came from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and, we, and you, taught, you taught in our streets. But he replied, I don't know you or where you came from. Away from me, all you evil doers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. By many who claim to know Jesus, who were a part of the church, or part of the nation of Israel, who even did mighty deeds in the name of Jesus, but did not know Him personally. They had no relationship with Him. Chapter 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, He was being carefully watched. There in front of Him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of His body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts of the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? He faces them directly with their hypocrisy again, trying to get them to repent. Not telling them He would not forgive them or anything else, but trying to get them to repent. Can you not see that you untie your donkey? Can you not see that people are suffering? Why would you not want to heal them? Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the reason the Sabbath was there in the first place. So you would realize that you need a Messiah that will come and bring you into, it, into an eternal Sabbath. But instead they remain silent. Verse 7. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. He continues to teach them with teachings they'll either get or they won't get. That's why I gave you the list of parables to study. So that you would study outside of just reading through Luke to know what you believe to take these stories and apply them with childlike knowledge. That's all you need. A farmer went out to sow his seed. There's only one good soil type. It's the one that produces a crop. Father, please produce a crop through me. Increase my faith. Humble me. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to be like Jesus. <clears throat> When someone, this is what Jesus said, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. Instead, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your guests. Verse 11, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
If you're not willing to lay down your life for Jesus, is He really your Lord? If you're not willing to humble yourself to be exalted later, if you're not willing to give up earthly treasures to build up heavenly treasures, then I, there's a word, hypocrite? Would that apply? Do you love God with all your heart, with all your mind, all your soul, all your strength? And does it permeate you where you have to love others because you feel compassion for them? You have to tell them about the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. You don't let the things of this world hinder you or stop you, and you don't let sins entangle you, but you strip all that away so that you can follow Jesus, love God, and love others so that hopefully they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Verse 15, when one of those at the table with him heard this, they said, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the, in the kingdom of God. This feast that we're going to have. This celebration. Because someone was lost and now they're found. Because a sinner has repented. So Jesus replied with a parable in verse 16, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. That's the biggest problem Kim is having with this journey. We would love to help you, but... Really? <laughs> You know, we got out of the habit of meeting with COVID and everything else, and we filled in our times, and we do, we do our, our uh, worship online or, or this or that. We are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. You can't be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ unless you're willing to be present, to do your part, to make a difference, to give a hug when a hug is needed, to give an encouraging word when an encouraging word is needed, to pick up a shovel if needed or anything else. Whatever it is that is needed, and then they see your good deeds, which glorify your Father in heaven, and then when you're given the opportunity, you tell them of the hope that you have. Because you try to force it down their throat, they're not going to listen, period. But if they see Jesus in you, then at some point they're going to ask, right, Merle? That's where he's at with his neighbor. They're going to ask you about why you're different. And the thing is, in this country, so many Christians have a bad name because there are so many hypocrites. Yeah, I said it. We say one thing, but our deeds, our life shows that we don't really believe what we say. <clears throat> a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited his guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. Verse 24. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. There it is again. Those who have made excuses, those who didn't really love Jesus because they didn't really know Jesus. It's time to think about where I'm at in this story. This gospel, this good news that Luke is writing. Verse 25, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said... If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And Jesus isn't teaching you to hate people because he's telling you to love people. But his, the love that you have for him has to be stronger than anything else. You have to put your faith and trust in him. And if you love someone that deeply, you will put your faith and trust in them. And guess what? He won't let you down. Other people will. That's why we have broken relationships everywhere, and God is in the relationship business of mending those relationships. And if you've been, your relationship's been mended through Jesus Christ to God Almighty, how can you not express that? How can you not live for that? <clears throat> if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And... Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So you've got to love Jesus more than anything, and you've got to be willing to do anything, including denying yourself, taking up that cross, that instrument of shame, persecution, suffering, and death, and follow after Jesus. Now, what does that look like? I don't know. What does that mean that I'm going to lose in this world? Who cares? What does it mean is going to happen to me? Don't know. 
But for me to live is to die so that I can gain everything of Christ, to experience His resurrection, to be with Him for all eternity, to know that I am forgiven. Because what can man do to me? And my Father knows what I need and will take care of me. Even in the worst times. That's what you're going to see in the movie Friday. Tortured for Christ. Because of the faith that she had and the things that she was willing to do. And she didn't worry about what men could do to her. Verse 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Now, what does that mean again? What, what, what have I got to do? Well, we'll get to that rich man coming up in chapter 18 who wasn't willing. Again, I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what it looks like for me. But there can't be anything that I love more than Jesus. There can't be anything that I'm willing not to give up for Jesus because that means I love it more than Jesus. Jesus means everything to me because He laid down His life. There is nothing I can do to get right with God. He did it for me. What can I do but giving back my life? Nothing else that I can even fathom doing. So why would I let something in this world keep me from doing that? Salt is good. It, it preserves. It seasons. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? If a disciple doesn't season, if a disciple loses that flavor and fervency in their life, how can it be made salty again? Verse 35, it is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. You're going to be getting into Revelation soon and you... You'll get Jesus' final words to seven different churches, and each time there's whoever has ears, let them hear, so that you understand and you obey, so that it changes you. Luke chapter 15. There are three more parables, back to back to back, with one gospel point. Salvation has come to you. The kingdom of God is at hand. Do you understand this salvation? And are, is it going to change you, and are you going to live for the kingdom? Verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners... Ooh, the worst of these. They were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Out of the mouth comes what's in the heart, doesn't it? Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you have a hundred sheep and loses one. Does he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over what? One sinner who repents, whether you're a Pharisee or a tax collector. You repent, you change your way of thinking, and say, I am spiritually bankrupt. Without your mercy and your grace, Lord, there is no way that I could be made right. And that all comes from Jesus Christ and what He has done for me. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with Your Spirit and lead me into righteousness. That means we can't stay the same we were. That means if we have to take up an instrument of suffering and, and persecution and death, so be it. That we are different. We are going to live for Jesus. There is more rejoicing over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. And you know that there are none righteous, no, not one. And as he's telling this story, remember these are stories familiar with the day. They may not be as familiar to you, but there were sheep herders everywhere. And they took care of their sheep. They led them to green pastures. They took care of them. They led them to still waters. I'm talking Psalm 23, if you didn't get that. And so forth. They, they literally put themselves down as the gate for the sheep so they could come in and go out. They took care of sheep. Dumb animals. <laughs> and you and I have been given the secrets of the kingdom of heaven so that we can shepherd others as Christ shepherds us. Shouldn't we have so much compassion that we go after that lost person when it's been put in our path? There will be more rejoicing over one sinner who repents. Then you've got the story of the woman with the coins. Ten coins, she loses one. And the same thing. She calls all her neighbors together and they, to celebrate with her. I don't get that one. 
But I do. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. And we're so worried about these little bits of money that we need to take care of ourselves that we don't put our faith and trust in God. We fear what we're going to lose financially so we, we don't give up these things. And that's the biggest thing. That's what we're getting up to in chapter 18 when that religious ruler said, I've kept all the commandments. And Jesus said, one thing you lack, go sell everything and follow me. Not that that's necessary, but if you're not willing, we just read that a minute ago, then you really don't love me. Therefore, you really don't know me. And then he tells this parable about a prodigal son. Some of your Bibles say that if they have a title or you've heard it that way. Some call it the parable of a lost son. But it seems like both son, sons are lost, doesn't it? And, and you kind of fit in the story one place or the other, period. It's got to hit you. Or the real point of the story is the parable of the prodigal God, the Father, who would love you so much that instead of squashing you out for your audacious sins against Him because of who He is, that He would say, guess what? I'll give you my Son. He'll take your place. If you'll just believe that and accept it, do you really believe? Have you accepted this? I love in verse 17, the NIV puts it this way. When that lost son, the one that went off on the prodigal living, which his brother accused him of spending it on harlots, we don't know if that's true or not, doesn't matter. But he wanted his inheritance so that he could live his life the way he wanted to live it now. You've been given an inheritance in the kingdom of God so that you can live your life as a child of the kingdom of God. Don't forget that. When he came to his senses, verse 17, Mindset. Wait a minute. Whatever that is in your life, when you come to your senses and say, I am a sinner, I was blind. What does that mean to you? Have you come to your senses yet? This son got out of the mud, went home, said, I'm going to tell my father that I've sinned against him and to ask for his forgiveness. The problem with the story is there's the, the other son there, the older son, who has sat there and, and, and won't go into the ceremony, the, worst, the uh, feast, the celebration. Wait a minute, that's what we've been talking about. Who's going to enter into this feast, this celebration? And the older son, in his hypocrisy with all his works of righteousness, won't go in because he's mad at his brother. Not his brother is a friend, brother, his brother. Wow, the grudges that we hold. Love keeps no records of wrong, doesn't it? Love thinks of others over itself. Don't go to bed at night if you still have a grievance against your brother. Don't bring your gift to the altar. And the older son won't go in even though the father pleads with him. What a sad story. We don't know what continues to go on. All we know is that the father was so happy to see the son. He hiked up his skirt, whatever you want to call it, and ran to his son. That was audaciously, prodigally not acceptable because the father owed, had the respect of the sons, not the other way around. And he said, I don't care. I'm running to my son because I love my son. He was lost and now he's found. He was dead in his tra trespasses and sin. Now he's alive. That's all that mattered to the father was running to him and giving him his inheritance. When the older son had all the inheritance at his fingertips, but wouldn't accept it because he wasn't willing to come in. Do you see where these parables are going? Verse 31, My son, the father said, You are always with me. This is to the older son. And everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you have this news, it should permeate everything about you so that you don't keep records of wrongs, so that you do love your enemies, so that you don't think about the things you want to do compared to, to the things that need to be done for someone else, so that you take time out of your busy schedule to do those things, to not make excuses, but to love others. 
to love them as Christ loved you. Three back-to-back parables about how children in the kingdom of God should live and love if they truly belong to the kingdom and will join in the celebration, the feasting. Prodigal love, prodigal salvation demands a response, a change in the way you think, repentance, so that you love God and love others with all of your heart. Time for more self-examination, at least for me. This is the good news of the gospel that's been given to me. What am I doing with it? Luke chapter 16. More parables, but to a different audience. Jesus told his disciples. Now we've gone away from the crowds. We've gone away from the religious hypocrites. And he's teaching his disciples. There was a rich man whose manager was accusing was accused of wasting his possession. So he called him and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because... You cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do? Verse 8, The the master commanded the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. He called all these people in and settled accounts with them that wasn't really his money in the first place, but he had been given authority to do this. Uh, Remember Jesus said, All authority in heaven has been given to me and he gives it to you and you don't need to worry about these other things, but you will be my witnesses. He has authority to do this, so he does this, but he does it wrong, (laughs) dishonestly. But you still got to admire the guy. There's the point of the parable. Because he took his worldly view and used it for his future. You've been given the kingdom of heaven, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, a checking account that's that's signed by God Almighty, the Holy Spirit living inside of you that will transform you, that will give you gifts that you don't even, can't even fathom that He'll give you, but are you drawing out of that account? Are you using it wisely, shrewdly? Are you using the wealth that you have, the physical abilities that you have, the talents that you have? Whatever it is, are you using them for the kingdom or are you wasting them or using them for something else? Every breath that you take, I'll say it again, is a gift of God. Every talent you have is because He gave it to you. The fact that you can get up today and speak and function is His grace. Use it wisely, shrewdly, and use it to build up treasures, not here on earth, but treasures in heaven. To love others and teach them the gospel message rather than overlooking them and say, I don't have time. Verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcome into your eternal dwellings. Jesus is not telling them to act dishonestly. He's telling them to be wise even to the point of being shrewd with what you do have. Think back to where we've already read in Luke about the rich fool. Remember him? He had things. He had the staff. He had the garden. He had the seed. He had whatever he had. However he got it by his own uh, dealings, whatever. He was rich. And all of a sudden he became richer because it was a good crop. And what did he do with it? He thought... To himself, he was not in his senses. I'll take that and store it up for my future. When maybe you should think about what God has given you today to be rich with it. Be shrewd in your dealings, especially when they come to kingdom of God dealings. Verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be, trust, can also be trusted with much. The wealth and riches of this world are little in comparison. Whatever you have, can you be trusted with it? But the more you have been given by God, the more that you should be a good steward because the more He's given you to be entrusted with. Do you see this? Whosoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with very much. The love of money is the root of all evil. It is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to pass through an eye of a needle. Riches 
will keep you entangled. They will become sins. They will be something that I trust in more than I trust in God. Can you be a good steward with what God has given you? Whatever you have today, are you a good steward with it? Are you using it wisely, even to the point of being shrewd, because you care about God and others more than you care about yourself? That's exactly what Jesus did. He gave up heaven to come down and become flesh and blood, to be mocked, to be whipped, to be crucified, to be forsaken by His Father so that you could be accepted by your, His Father. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, how will you, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trusted with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now the Pharisees are still in this audience group even though he's talking to the disciples. In verse 14, the Pharisees, Luke puts it in here, who loved money. Hits them right in the face again. He's trying to teach his disciples, but it's going to hit the hypocrisy in the face. They heard all this and they sneered at Jesus. And he said to them, You are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. What people value highly is detestable to God. Jesus goes on to tell the religious to repent again. And he tells them this story or a parable or maybe it's a real account of Lazarus. And the reason I say all those things is the only parable, if it's a parable, that has a person's name. But you know the story. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a further teaching illustration regardless if it's a parable or not. This man had nothing and this rich man had something. This rich man constantly didn't give this guy because he had no pity, no compassion in his heart whatsoever. And they both die. And then the rich man is in torment, and Lazarus is not. And the answer to that is you had your good times, your wealth, your riches, whatever you want to say, while you were alive, and you wasted it. You did not act shrewdly. You did not have compassion, and you certainly didn't use it for the kingdom of God. Too late. You can all you want to, but you're not coming in. What about my brothers? Send Lazarus back. Well, you know, if they don't know about someone raising from the dead, which is Jesus Christ, they're not going to believe anything else. They're not going to believe Him. It's too late. Use your riches wisely. Don't think you are rich and be a fool because you are spiritually bankrupt without Jesus Christ. Luke 17, Jesus turns the conversation back to His disciples again. Jesus said to His disciples, verse 1, The things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. As you're reading this long, if you're reading it all, if you're listening, if you have ears to hear, where am I at in this story? Because if I'm a hypocrite... In any form or fashion, in any hypocrisy, I need to ask God to help take it from me because I could be causing others to stumble. Blind leading the blind into a pit and both of them are headed for destruction. Woe to you! It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, Repent, you must forgive them. Oh, wait a minute, this takes me right back. Am I that older brother <laughs> who thinks I've been doing all these righteous deeds and I deserve because my other brother went off and squandered it all? Or do I have compassion and say, Ha! Ah, he has been found. I know in my own life that John helped me see that because John would aggravate the hound out of me. <laughs> but grace is grace. Mercy is mercy. And when he died, he was at peace said, saying that he knew Jesus Christ and I could not have any more joy in my heart than I've ever had because I hope to see him. I hope his salvation is genuine. I don't care if he came in at the last minute of the day and got his full page of paid wages. Why should I care about that? 
What I care about is that he will spend eternity in heaven because he figured out God's grace through Jesus Christ. Whether there were any works or not doesn't matter. It matters that he came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the apostle said to the Lord then, verse 5, increase our faith because it slapped them in the face, their own hypocrisy. We need our faith increased so that we won't wind up going astray. We won't think we're any more righteous than we are. We won't let anything entangle us. We won't let the riches of this world entice us. We won't let the fears of what men can do to us stop us. And they all head for martyrdom except John. Because they will deny themselves. They will take up their cross. It will take them to their death. But they will follow Jesus into eternity. And Jesus replied in verse 6, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed. We went back to that already because we've already had that parable. That we don't know how this necessarily happens. It's a small tiny seed, but it grows big. So if you ask God and you continue to remember that ask, seek, knock thing, that He will increase your faith and it will grow and grow and grow. So that when you are brought into the synagogues and people threaten your life and you don't even know what to say, the Holy Spirit will speak for you. Increase our faith, Lord, so that we can be like Jesus. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus heals ten lepers who cry out for pity and mercy. That's where we're getting to at the end of Luke chapter 18 because we all need to cry out for God's pity and His mercy. But only one comes back and says, Thank you, worships God. And he's a Samaritan. Get that? He's that Samaritan. We already got an example of the good Samaritan where the Levite and the priest wouldn't do what was right because of their hypocrisy. This guy was a Samaritan. He, he, don't, he doesn't know what he should do, but yet he does it because it's in his heart. Wow. Verse 20, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. But see, the world's going to go on as business as usual. Just like in the days of the flood, just like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was one righteous man, Noah, who built an ark, condemned the world, was a preacher of righteousness. He did this out of holy fear to save his family. Not his own neck, but his family is what Hebrew says. His children and their children. And Lot, which is crazy to think that he's righteous because he's in the world, but, but Scripture tells us later in the New Testament that he was totally grieved in his soul because he stayed there instead of leaving that world behind him. And his wife did look back and was turned into a pillar of salt. But see, it was business as usual until what? God's wrath came upon them. Now, if you don't want to face God's wrath, there's one man that can help you, Jesus Christ. Will you put your faith and trust in Him? Will you not look back? Will you enter into Jesus and never longingly look back? Because if, you, if a disciple longingly looks back, once he's put his hand to the plow to be a servant, he is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Remember that? Will you be there? Will your hypocrisy stop you? Will your sin stop you? Does Jesus mean more than anything to you? Verse 32, Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Give it up. It doesn't mean anything. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. Do not fear. Do not trust in anything else. Do not love anything else more than Jesus and the salvation that God is offering you through Him. Luke chapter 18. Then Jesus told this parable to His disciples that they should always pray and not give up. The persistent widow demands justice. She keeps on and on and on till the unjust judge gives it to her. Justice will come. You should be crying out for it but you should be trying to get people to see the light in the meantime when they come to you by seeing your good deeds. Verse 8, I tell you, he will see that they do get justice and quickly. 
It might seem like God's taking His time, but we know that it's in His time frame. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on earth? Faith that you live a life as a disciple. You don't worry about every, anything else. You've already been taught, taught to increase my faith so that I can live a life that's not a life of hypo hypocrisy. Verse 9, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee thought he was religious, relied on all that, and yet it was obvious if he would have examined himself. And the tax collector instead knew he was a sinner, knew he was spiritually bankrupt, and he said, Have mercy on me, a sinner. Which one is justified? Pretty simple to figure out. Verse 15, people were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked him. They still don't understand this childlike acceptance of the kingdom of God. Verse 16, but Jesus called the children to him. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, and when you see that, that means listen up. If you have ears to hear, listen. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter into it. And now we have a real life example. That young rich ruler, which you can get in the other gospel accounts, a certain young rich ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That means that Jesus is saying He is God and He can offer forgiveness for sins. You know the commandments, verse 20. I'll say it again. I'm looking at you. You know the commandments. Have you kept them? <laughs> this guy audaciously says he has and Jesus doesn't, doesn't reprimand him. But I know I haven't kept the commandments. Little kids know they haven't kept the commandments. We did our story time this past week, and we used cookies up here to entice them. Just cookies. And I said, at some point, Mom and Dad said, don't eat one of these cookies, but at some point, you're going to get one, aren't you? Because you desire it. I said, and think even more if it would gain you knowledge like Eve. You don't, don't blame her or Adam for following after or anything else. You just simply did it because they were yummy. And I walked them in front of them, made them smell them, but not touch them. You're all guilty of sin. We, there are none of us righteous, no, not one. So don't think any highly, more highly of yourself. It is by God's grace. Cry out for justice, but cry out for His pity and His mercy. And it's already been given to you. You just got to accept it. Jesus Christ laid down His life for His sheep. <clears throat> but what happens? The man says, I've done all these. And then Jesus says... Verse 22, you still lack one thing. You haven't repented. Sell everything you have. Whoa, 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 that's going to stop me for whatever reason. Because I'm not willing to sell everything. It's not necessarily about the money or the prestige. It may simply be about what am I going to, how am I going to eat tomorrow? Oh, Lord, give us today our daily bread, which means today and tomorrow's bread. Because I won't worry about anything else. But because he wasn't willing to do all that, and then Jesus said after that, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, put that in there, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Because they do have a need, and you're supposed to be a good steward, and it might be that I made you rich so that you can be rich to others. Are you following all this in Luke? And then you'll have treasures in heaven. His question was, how do I inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him with, you'll have eternal life, and treasures in heaven. He didn't just answer his question. He said, and you'll have this. But he wasn't willing to. It was so dramatic to the disciples that they literally said, who then can be saved? And Jesus assures them that since they have left everything, that they will have riches in heaven. This chapter ends with a blind beggar. But before we get there, does Jesus mean everything to you? Is it worth selling everything to gain salvation? And then if you're a good steward and you live your life and you don't waste it to even have treasures, 
He said it to the rich man. He said it to his disciples who gave up everything to follow him. Some people say, oh, when we get to heaven, it'll all be blah, blah. Jesus teaches rewards. I don't know how that's going to look anything else. But he says for those who gave up, they will have blessings, treasures in this earth, whatever that looks like, whether they have nothing or not, they're rich. And then they'll have treasures in the kingdom of heaven where moth cannot come in and thieves cannot come in and steal. You just take that however you want to take it. But there's a difference in being saved and just living and being saved and really living for the kingdom of God. And that's the gospel message, and that's what Luke is telling you. Don't let anything hinder you. That's what Hebrews is telling you. That's what Paul tells you all the time. Don't let anything hinder you from living what you say that you proclaim. A blind beggar receives his sight. Verse 35, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus told him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Now, if you're reading and studying, and you should be just more than just reading it, it should be food to you, that you're getting nourishment, you need this spiritual food, you need the bread of life, Jesus, more than you need physical food. And most of us have probably eaten more physical food than we've ate spiritual food this week, if we want to be honest. You should have studied this in two other Gospels, Matthew and Mark. In Matthew, you'll know there are two men. Oh, that's just like the two demon-possessed men. And we know one of them wanted to follow Jesus, but he said, go back and be a light in your own community. We don't know what happened to the other man. Did he see that, oh, I can be a pig farmer now? We don't know. There are two blind men here. And we learned the name in Mark of who the blind man is. But there are two blind men here, and we know that one of them asked for mercy. And both of them were healed, by the way, or given sight. The one took his sight, said, I was blind, now I see. And we see that his actions proved that he could see because he followed after Jesus. Now you say, well, they were blind beggars. They didn't have much to give up. Really? He didn't have to do anything for his work before. He just begged and got it. Now he's got to work. Now he's got to do whatever he's got to do. I don't know. But even as a blind beggar, I got some security in the fact that I'm getting taken care of. Yeah, I long to see, but when I long to see, well, I want to then live my life. I think that's what the other blind beggar did, because he's not in the story. But I don't know that. It's just where I'm reading in this, I'm like, I know that one followed Jesus. He didn't worry about that. Now, I've got to say that I probably think this from my own heart. If I was blind, and I'd been blind for however long, and now I've been given sight, there's so many things on my bucket list I want to do before it's too late. Right? And God gave me this world to enjoy. This blind beggar simply follows Jesus, and Jesus is heading to his death. He can't do anything else because of the great salvation healing that he's been given. You know what his name is? Bartimaeus. What does Bar mean? Son of... Barnabas, son of encouragement. Barabbas, son of the father, who was really not a fa son of the father. He was the son of the devil. This is Bartimaeus, son of the unclean. Wow! And then I'm th sitting there thinking, God is so sovereign. There was a blind man on the road that day. His name was Bartimaeus, son of the unclean. And he realized he was unclean before God. And he realized Jesus of Nazareth was coming by, and the crowd, which would have been his disciples in there also, said, quit bothering him. They didn't see the compassion. They didn't see the love. They didn't see the equality of all mankind, that it's God's desire for all men to come to salvation. They saw somebody worthless. They saw somebody coming to Jesus and bothering him, whatever they saw. They didn't see a human being reaching out to Jesus, but Jesus saw him. Wow! He said, what do you want me to do for you? Give me my sight so that I can worship and praise you and be a light to others.